Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. In the word of God. For, and uh, excuse me, in the gospel of John. The gospel of John. One, chapter one. Verse 29. My God. Yeah. I feel the presence of the Holy Ghost moving. They always used to say in this place. But I believe not only is he moving in this place, but he's moving right where you are too. I feel the presence of the Holy Ghost moving through the airways. Through my phone, to your phone, to your computer, from my home to your home, I feel the presence of the Holy Ghost Lighthouse of Love. Oh, glory, and I give him the glory, the honor, and the praise, and I want him to know he is welcome to do just what he wants to do. Yay. Yeah. Oh, my God. Mm. Yay. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes to your will and yes to your way. John 1 and 29. It reads as such. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him. He looked off and he saw Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John looked off and he saw something that needed or someone that needed an introduction. He wanted all those that were around to see what he saw. He said, open your eyes, behold, look and see the Lamb of God. He is the Lamb that God himself sent down from heaven who has come which taketh away the sin of the world. The, Matthew, the 27th chapter, verses 35 through 37 says, Matthew, the 27th chapter, verses 35 through 37 says, the soldiers nailed Jesus to a cross and gambled to see who would get his clothes. Then they sat down to guard him. Above his head, they put a sign that told why he was nailed there. Hmm. The soldiers nailed Jesus to the cross. Can you see it? Envision your Savior, the Lamb of God, the one that Jan John told us to behold, the one who had come to take away the sins of the world. Can you envision him on that cross nailed. Mm. And then the soldiers put above his head, up above his head, a sign that told why he was nailed there. And this is what it read. This is Jesus. The one who is below this sign. The one who is nailed below this sign that the soldiers have put on this cross. The one who is nailed right here. This is Jesus. 
the king of the Jews. And lastly, we are going to go to Exodus, the 12th chapter, the 23rd verse, Exodus 12 and 23, which reads, when the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame and will pass over the doorway, glory to God, and he will per not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. I'm taking my subject, glory to God, from John the first ver chapter, verse 29. The next day, John seeth coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And the subject that I am going to speak with you about today is blood on my doorpost. Blood on my doorpost. Glory to God. Blood on my doorpost. When you look, and I love the Bible, and if you know anything about me, I love history. And the Bible is a historical reference to civilization and not just a historical reference to civilization, but, but our religion as we know it and how we got to be here in this place and time and believe what we believe and why we believe what we believe and in whom we believe what we believe. And when you read the Bible, I love it because we know that there, it is truth to those that truly read it. Of course, there are going to be haters out there that are going to say it's not true. But well, I've read the word of God and, and, you know, I just believe it's just fiction and it's just a bunch of writings and, and a bunch of stories that man has made up, passed down through fables, passed down through generations and blah, 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 blah. We know that people will say that they have read the word of God and still don't believe. But the Bible tells us that, that it is not only to be read in the physical sense, but it is to be read in the spiritual sense. And unless the spirit has revealed it to you, unless God himself opens up your spiritual eyes and reveals what you were reading, then it is just words on a paper. Paper. It is not just to read the word of God, but it is to read it in spirit and in truth. It is to read it, to, to, to ask God every time you read it and to read a scripture, to ask God to reveal his word to you. The Bible, I want to let you know, is a living and breathing spirit. It is the word of God. The word of God was Jesus. The Bible tells us in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. The Bible itself, the word of God is a living, breathing spirit. And, and the only way you can understand it is that you must be in the spirit. If you try to read it in the flesh, it will not make sense. And, and I love the word of God because when we read the word of God and we read it spiritually, and even if you read it not in the spirit, you cannot deny that there are many prophecies that were written about and spoken about through the word of God. And if you open your spiritual eyes to to actually ask God to reveal what he is saying. I mean, those prophecies are right before your eyes, glory to God. 
And I mean, and, and, and I love it because you, you, we have prophecies like in Genesis 3 and 15, the Messiah would be born of a woman. These are Bible prophecies, glory to God, that have shown us that we can stand on and, and, and then that let us know that there is no way to deny Jesus is the Lord, especially when we read them in the spirit and our eyes are opened up to these biblical prophecies all throughout the Old Testament prophecies after prophecy, like Micah 5 and 2, the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. You cannot deny that that's where Jesus was born. I mean, you can say, well, he was a fictional character and you can deny and everything that is written out the word of God and those that do, I pray for their souls. But when you truly want to believe and you truly are ready to seek truth, and truly ready to receive that wisdom that the Bible, that only the Bible can give you, then you understand that when you are reading these Bible prophecies, they point to none other than Jesus Christ. Now, one prophecy in itself to say he was born uh, of a woman. Well, every man that we know was born of a woman to say he was born in Bethlehem, where everybody that was born in Bethlehem could fall in that prophecy. But when you start putting them all together, like it says, Messiah will be born of a virgin that the Messiah would come in the line of Abraham, that the Messiah would be the Messiah would be the descendant of Isaac and Jacob, that the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah, glory to God, that, that he would be an heir to King David's throne, that the Messiah would be the anointed and eternal one, glory to God. When you start seeing that the Messiah would be called Emmanuel and, and that he would spend some seasons in Egypt and glory to God, it goes on and on that he would be called a Nazarene and that he would be preceded by Elijah the son and he would be declared the son of God and that he would bring light to Galilee. When you keep on reading them, it goes on and on that he would speak in power parables, then yes, you could say one or two of these may go to one person, but it is undeniable when you put it all together and that you see that Jesus was the only one to fulfill them all. <laughs> I say that because to, to quote all of just that few of the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. Those were all good, but I have a favorite prophecy. And that Bible prophecy, glory to God, was written in Exodus. And it was a Bible prophecy that did not just necessarily say that Jesus himself would do this or that the Messiah would do this, but it was a prophecy that Jesus himself came and this was his whole purpose to come and do. This was the reason that Jesus said, I would go. Because when they looked around, they could find no one else who could do this. Now, Moses and, and Aaron or David and Solomon or Elijah and, and Jeremiah may have been able to do some of the things. But this one prophecy, this one fulfillment was the only thing that our Lord and Savior could do. Exodus 12, 1 through 14. It is an important book of the Bible and when you look at it and understand it and read it and ask the spirit to truly open your eyes, it's not just a story. It's not just glory to God. Tara says, my audio stopped. Sister Brown said it stopped. Okay, okay, glory to God. Um, if y'all can hear me, would you just say amen? Can everybody hear me? Just type amen in there if you can hear me before I proceed. All right, glory to God. So I say that because, thank y'all, because the devil 
has been doing some things today and he's been really trying to attack my family. He's been trying to attack um, the, uh, just those that are part of the lighthouse. Look, because some reason he did not want y'all to get this word. And so I say that glory to God where I was when I was talking about the and because I want all of you to be able to hear this It's important. This is why this particular prophecy was important to me. Exodus 12, 1 through 14. It reads, sometime later, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron. This month is to be the first month of the year for you. Tell the people of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, the head of each family must choose a lamb or, or young goat for the family to eat. If any family is too small to eat the animal, they must share it with their next door neighbors. Choose the, a, a, either a sheep or a goat, but it must be one year old, a one-year-old male that has nothing wrong with it meaning that it must not have a spot, nor must it have a blemish. Glory to God. They, it was written that God told Moses, glory to God, to tell the children of Israel that they must follow these rules to the exact, they always say, uh, it's, it's be careful when you quote the word of God that the Bible lets us know that every uh, uh, period, dot, and tittle, and cross of a T is correct in the word. That there is nothing fake to it. And when we do God's will, we can't change it. It is death unto a man to change. That, that will curse you to uh, eternal hell. And it lets us know that 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 God was letting us know even in this that the children of Israel had to follow every step to accuracy. It said that it must be large enough, glory to God, for everyone. It must be large enough for everyone to have some of the meat. Each family must take care of its animal until the evening of the 14th day of the month when the animals are, are to be killed. Some of the blood must be put on the doorpost and above the door of each house where the animals are to be eaten. Mm -hmm. That night, the animals are to be roasted and eaten together with bitter herbs and thin bread made without yeast. <coughs> Excuse me. Don't eat the meat raw or boiled. Glory to God. The entire animal, including its head, legs, and insides, must be roasted. Eat what you want that night and the next morning. Burn whatever is left. When you eat the meal, be dressed and ready to travel. When you eat the meal, be dressed and ready to travel. Oh, glory, hallelujah. Have your sandals on. Carry your walking stick in your hand and eat quickly. This is the Passover festival to honor me, the, your Lord. The same night I will pass through Egypt and kill the firstborn son in every family and the firstborn male of all animals. I am the Lord and I will punish the gods of Egypt. The blood on the houses will show me where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Then you won't be bothered by the terrible disasters I bring on Egypt. Remember this day. Remember, saints, this day. Remember, saints, this day and celebrate it each year as a festival in my honor. 
Glory to God. And we know that it goes on to verse 23 that says, when, and I read that to you at the beginning, when the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame and pass over the doorway and will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. And that is why we must put, and he let them know, Put the blood on your doorpost. Put it on your doorpost and glory to God. Put it on the top of your door. We know, glory to God, that Egypt had enslaved Israel. Like many of us, we may not have been enslaved to Egypt, but Somewhere, somehow in our life, we were enslaved to something. It may have been a man. It may have been a woman. It may have been glory to God, your job. It may have been drugs. It may have been abuse. But whatever it was, sickness or whatever, whatever it was, you were enslaved to it. Just like Israel. They had been enslaved to, to, and the Bible tells us that 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 um, that there was a Pharaoh that rose up in the land who did not know Joseph, and that he manifested upon the people of, or upon the the children of Israel um, in a, a, a form of work or labor that was not like any other they had ever experienced. Experienced in their life, it was so oppressive that and and, and and that they were starved and they weren't given the food like they should have. Glory to God! And they were not giving payment for their labor. Glory to God! And many were were killed and abused along the way. They were enslaved to a master that they could not be set free from. So after God brought judgment after judgment, sign after sign, miracle after miracle upon the, the children of Egypt to show that he, when he sent Moses to tell Pharaoh to let my people go, that Pharaoh did not. So God provided all of these miracles and signs and plagues and, 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 and things to happen, nine of them. And, 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 and then at the, at the moment that every time it looked like Pharaoh was about to let the people of Israel go, God hardened his heart. These were all to show glory to God because the Egyptians had so many gods. So Pharaoh, when it was brought about um, to, to, to that the God I am that I am had come and, and Moses and Aaron had brought it into his courts and said, let my people go that we represent the God I am that I am. Pharaoh didn't know that God. But he knew the Egyptian gods and that's why all the other curses that were brought about was a way to show Pharaoh that our God was far more stronger than any of his gods. And each plague represented a way to, to overcome and, and overpower and show that those gods were nothing compared to the God, the great I am that I am that Moses represented. And so Moses brought this to the children of Israel and he said that God is about to do something terrible in the land and, and before he does it that you need to put glory to God take you a lamb glory to God and and on and glory to God and on the 10th day of the of the month glory to God and that month would have been the month of Nisan which falls glory to God the Jewish month of Nisan falls between March and April and do you and it said the first month glory to God of the year and we know that Nisan now glory to God is not considered the first month of the year but but what happened and that that Rosh Hashanah, glory to God, when it is celebrated, it celebrates the Jewish New Year. But what happened is that originally in Egypt, Nisan was the first month of the year. But after the Jews went to Babylon 
and, and the Jews were freed from Babylon, they decided to make glory to God uh, and change um, the, the date and make Rosh Hashanah the celebration glory to God of Rosh Hashanah to celebrate, which is in, I believe, um, September or so. It is the, to celebrate that, that when the Jews or commemorate when they were brought out of Babylon, but originally Nisan was the first month of the year. And God decided to make this the beginning for their new life and their new found freedom. He says on the 10th day of this month, the head of each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for his family to eat. He says, if it, and then he goes on to say that that goat must be, or that lamb must be without spot or wrinkle. He says that it must be large enough for everyone to eat. Glory to God. Then he lets us know that on the glory to God, the 14th month, day of the first month of the year, that that lamb was to be I mean, it was to be killed, glory to God, and, and that they were to roast the animal. They could not boil the lamb. They could not eat it raw. It had to be roasted and eaten together with bitter herbs and, and thin bread made without yeast. And he let us know that this was the Passover festival in honor of him. It was in God's honor. He said, it is in honor of me, your Lord. Now, here is some significance to this. We know that God let, let us know that they had to take the blood of that animal. And they had to put that blood on the doorpost. And then they had to also put it above on the top one. And, and glory to God, the Bible let us know that when they did that, that when the Passover, when I mean when the death angel came through the land and looked and searched, God said that, that you will not be hurt or touched by what will happen to this terrible disaster that he would bring upon Egypt because he would recognize that you live there. Glory to God. Now, there is something significant about the doorpost and the blood. If you look at where they painted the, the blood, when they, they put it on there, they put it on there right up on each side. And then they put it on the top. Why is this so significant? Because if you know anything about gravitational pull. If you're taking something that's liquid like that, we know the blood was not just going to stay right there, that it was going to run down. But even more so, it would drip down from the top of the door to the ground and to the ground there under it. And if you can envision that in your eyes, what better picture of the cross? is there than the blood on the right and the left. We envision our, our Savior stretched wide, arms on the right and the left. And then we envision his hands pierced, glory to God. And when he was pierced to the wood, glory to God, to the cross, stretched out, it was no different than the blood on the doorpost that, that, that we can see that our God was stretched out himself. But then when you see the blood on the top of the door, we envision, glory to God, the crown of thorns that were pierced in his head and the blood running down. And then we see that that, that same blood drip to the ground and we see the bottom of the cross where our Savior himself, where John said, behold, the Lamb of God that comes to take away the sins of the world. We see the Lamb of the God stretched on the cross, his hands pierced, the crown of thorns on his head. And then we look at the blood that is dripped to the ground on the doorway and we see that his ankles had been pierced too.
What better prophetic viewpoint of our Savior than to read Exodus, glory to God, the 12th chapter, and realize that this was the greatest glory to God. That almost Messiah. This was the greatest, my God, my messianic prophecy that we could see in the Bible. Because when we see the blood on the door, we see our Savior, where God says, and where Jesus himself said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. And God said that when we believed that he was our Savior, that he sacrificed our lives for us, that, that, that glory to God, that he, we alone with him would be able to utter these same words that he uttered himself. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Oh, grave, where is your, your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? We would be able to let hell know that it no longer had power over us. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 through 21 says, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses upon them, and have committed unto us the word, the word of reconciliation. Oh, glory. Now then, now then we are ambassadors of Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, glory to God. Be ye reconciled to God. Do you not know that God, that is why he sent, not only sent the lamb and the blood to protect you, but it was to also reconcile you to him. The blood washes away your sin, but it did not just tell us glory to God to just receive the word, the blood, but we know that also God commanded them to roast the lamb and that it had to be eaten all. You had to eat it all. And he said it, and you had to make sure that it was more than enough for everyone. How many of you know Jesus is more than enough for you? Oh, yes, he is. He is more than enough for your sins. He's more than enough for your sickness. He's more than enough for your rebellious child. He's more than enough to fix your marriage. He's more than enough to heal your infirmity. He's more than enough to bring peace into your home. He's more than enough. You got to put the blood upon your doorpost. And when you try Jesus and put the blood upon your doorpost, you will see that he's more than enough. It went on to say, for he have made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It told us glory to God. In Exodus, God commanded the children of Israel to roast him. Glory to God. And, and it told the children of Israel to eat him. When we See that glory to God. We have no better picture than the picture of communion when Jesus said that this is my wine. This is this wine represents my blood. Uh huh. The blood that will wash your sins away. Take this wine and drink it. And when you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. This it bread represents my body, which was broke, will be broken and bruised for you. Take, eat this bread. Oh, my, 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 my. And do it in remembrance of me. The Bible lets us know, and it told us even in Exodus, that the bread had to be leavened. See, unleavened bread, that means that there could not be any leaven in the bread. We know a little leaven, it, uh, glory to God, destroys the, uh, ruins the whole lump, glory to God. That, that when it represents 
when it talks about us eating his body or eating the lamb of God, it ta- tells us that he had to be roasted and eaten with bitter herbs and eaten with unleavened bread. That means that glory to God, that you and I, the bitter herbs, represented the pain and the sin that he bore for us, that it was bitter to his taste, that God himself even seemed to turn his back on our Lord and Savior because the stench of sin that he carried, the bitterness to God's taste, that that is what those herbs represent, the pain, the hurt, the destruction, the problems, the trials, the tribulation that he bore for you and I. Those were represented by the bitter herbs, glory to God, that the children of Israel were commanded to eat. And the unleavened bread represented you coming to him in humbleness, glory to God. You can't come to God all puffed up in yourself thinking you're all of that acting like the Pharisees and the Sadducees you had to come to him like Mary Magdalene you had to come to him like a prostitute you had to come to him glory to God like the lame like those that had lepers like the little children you had to come to him like the woman with the issue of blood just as you are here I am God I know I know I'm not perfect. I know I'm not right. I know I'm a sinner or a wretch undone. And I know I need you, Jesus. You got to come to him with no leaven inside of you. You got to put a pin in that puffiness and let it out and come to God just as you are recognizing that you need Jesus, that you need the blood on your doorpost. Even in Revelations, Revelation, the 21st chapter, verses 4 through 5, it says, And God shall wipe away all tears from that. Oh, yeah, you may be crying. You may be hurting when you come to him. But I'm here to tell you, he'll wipe those very tears out your eyes. And there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Oh, they may not believe. You know, in Egypt, Pharaoh did not believe. The Egyptians did not believe. But when Aaron and Moses walked and told him, to let the people of Israel go, even though they didn't believe. God showed them and he let them know that everything that Moses was saying was faithful and true. I'm here to let you know that the word of God is faithful and true. What it says is what it says. You can stand on it and you can believe it. Glory to God. When we look at John, and, and how he wrote in Revelation 5 and 10. It said John began to cry. Because it says, and, and who is worthy to open the scroll and break the seals? No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or see it inside. And what the scrolls represent was the word of God. Not one of us was able to fulfill what was written therein. Not one of us was worthy to speak and proclaim what was written therein. But the, and John, when he heard it, he began to cry. Then one of the elders said to me, John said, stop crying and look. The one who is called both the lion from the tribe of Judah and King David's great descendant has won the victory. He will open the book and its seven seals. Oh God, I'm here to tell you, Jesus will make God's word available to you and I. Oh yes, and it said that they, they begin to sing a song, glory to God, as they praise Jesus, as they praise the Lamb of God, 
and he is the Lamb of God. John said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Because whether John knew it or not, that he would be that sacrificial lamb whose blood would be put upon the doorpost of our life, whose blood would come and wash us whole, whose sacrifice that we would eat would heal our very wounds, it would heal our very sickness. Oh, he is the lamb of God and they began to worship him and say you are worthy to receive the scrolls and open his seal because you were killed and with your own blood you brought God you bought God people from every tribe language nation and race you let them become kings and serve God as priests and they will rule on earth it is only because of his sacrifice that we are able to serve God as priests it is only through God's sacrifice oh yes he said he is the king of kings and lord of lords it is only through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that you are able to be a king in this world and rule. You're not ruling on your own accord, but you're ruling because of the blood that is on your doorpost. Because you should have been dead and gone. You should have been on your way to a burning hell. But it is because of the blood and the sacrifice of the Lamb of God that came to take away the sins of the world that you're able to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. Oh, I thank God for the blood. Matthew 26 and 28 says, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Hebrews 9, glory to God, and 22 says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission, glory to God. Hebrews 9, glory to God, and 12 says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, nor by his own blood he entered in once, into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. It is by the blood and only by the blood, woman of God. It is by the blood and only by the blood, man of God, that we are able to come into the presence of God, that we are able to be healed and delivered and set free. It is only by the blood and through the blood that you can sleep at night and have peace in your own bed, knowing that your child is out there on the streets doing anything and everything, but you have prayed to God and pleaded the blood of Jesus Christ upon your child, and it is because of the blood that you can sleep at night knowing that your child is covered under the blood of Jesus. First John 2 and 2 says, and he was the appropriation for our sins, and not only ours, Oh, not for not ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. Revelations 1 and 5, and from, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and first begotten of the dead and prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Oh, today, y'all, what better day? than to do a communion service, than to understand truly why we do it. I had to preach this word to let you, you, and you know that, that Jesus Christ, it is more to just him than the Lord's Supper and sitting there and saying do communion that when he did what he did beyond that communion table, when he went to the cross and died for me, when he shed his precious blood, when he rose again with all power in his hands, and then he sent back his Holy Spirit. If you will read at the uh, in, in glory to God Exodus, it said, remember this day. And it told him to go and celebrate, run and celebrate. Do you know? And he said to, to go and get up out of Egypt. God said, remember this day. What better day 
than not only to do communion service, but to give your life to him so that you can run on and do the will of God, so that you can bless his name in the midnight hour, so that you can praise him because come hell or high water, you know that there is blood on your doorpost. What better day than to take communion? Then will you truly understand that not only am I just taking wine and bread, but I truly am doing what the children of Israel did because I see, he said, remember, do this in remembrance of me. I see my Savior stressed wide upon a cross. I see my Savior with a crown of thorns on his head, blood dripping down from his whipped back upon a cross, from those thorns on his head, from those spikes in his hands, from those that spike in his ankles. I see my Savior when he hung his head and the locks of his shoulders and said, it is finished. What better day? Glory to God, did to do communion when your eyes have been opened and you realize why you take it and why you do what you do. And then what better day than to run for Jesus, give your life to the Lord and Savior because the, door, the blood is on your doorpost. I bless his holy name. And I glorify him today. Oh, yes, saints. There is blood. That is ready to be put on your doorpost. There is blood that was shed that is ready to be painted. Because that blood came from the true Lamb of God. The unspotted, unblemished Lamb of God that came to take away the sins of this world. What better day than to take communion? Than to take it after you truly realize that your Lord and Savior even fulfilled prophecy when he became the Lamb of God. Hey, hey, that ain't on fire. Because he knew your mama couldn't do it. He knew your daddy couldn't do it. Not your brother, not your sister. Not your children, not your grandma or your grandpa. Not Moses, not Elijah. Not Jeremiah, not Samson. Samson was a strong man, but he could not do it. Moses built a, uh, Moses led a children through glory to God, the Red Sea, and still could not do it. Noah built an ark and could not do it. Abraham was the father of faith and he still could not do it. Only the Lamb of God. It is his blood that we must put on our doorposts. And then there's no devil in hell, neither death nor the grave, not even your haters can come against the blood of Jesus. If you do not know Jesus for the pardon of your sins and in the pardon of your sins, would you repeat after me? Father God, you may be a backslider. You may be still dealing with some things you're trying to let go of. Stop trying and just let God. Repeat after me, Father God, I know I'm a sinner. And I know my judgment is death. 
And right now, in the name of Jesus, I admit, I confess, and I profess that Jesus Christ died for my sins and he is my Lord and Savior. Now, Father God, we because he's my Lord and Savior and I profess him, I also confess that I need your Holy Ghost to live within me. To keep me from going to the places I shouldn't go. To keep me from doing the things that I shouldn't do. I need your Holy Ghost and anointing that I may be healed from this sickness or infirmity. I need your Holy Ghost power right now to deliver me and set me free. I need you, Lord. I need you. I need you right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, I believe that God is going to do it today for you. I believe that God is already working it out. Oh, glory to God. I thank each and every one of you, Lighthouse of Love, for just being a part of this service today. And you know how we always do it. But before we go out with our praise, I just want to say I believe that there is going, the devil is going to be mad because he's going to be going, looking all around, seeking who he may devour. And when he looks, he's going to see the blood. Oh, the blood. There's the blood. Oh, no. She's put the blood. To no, he's got the blood. To oh, the blood, the blood, the blood. I thank God for the blood. Are you painting it? I know I am. I pray you have a blessed week, Lighthouse of Love. And until I see you or hear from you in Bible study or next week in our Glory to God uh, next week youth service, may you have a blessed week and may you continue to keep the blood on your doorpost. So let's go out of here with a praise to our God, singing all oh, the blood of Jesus. See you next week, Lighthouse of Love. I love each and every one of you. God bless you.